السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين We commence by praising Allah سبحانه وتعالى sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and all his companions may Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless them may he bless his entire household and may he bless every single one of us and grant us every form of goodness. This evening, mashallah, we read very powerful verses of Surah Al-An'am where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made mention of some of what has occurred during the Meccan period and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has comforted Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Perhaps tomorrow we will go through some of these verses and we will see how and when they were revealed. Some of them are connected to the persecution faced by those who accepted Islam early on. And as we do know and we learned yesterday, the first person to accept the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was his own wife Khadija radiallahu anha. May Allah be pleased with her. And thereafter we have Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu who was only 10 years old, a young boy at the time. He was the first boy to accept Islam, the second person to accept Islam. He agreed with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immediately because they knew the man was truthful. They knew the credentials of this man. They knew exactly what his standing was and they knew that he was not in a position to come to them and to tell them some lies. And over and above that, the message itself was so pure, so pristine. Common sense would be that it is calling towards that which is purity. It is not calling towards his own elevation, worshipping him, giving him wealth, acknowledging him and so on. No, it was to do with the link between a man and his maker. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that link and may he make us from those who understand. We have thereafter, we made mention of Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anh and how he refused to go back with his parents and instead he decided to remain with Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we made mention of them, may Allah be pleased with them. They too, subhanallah, accepted what their dad had to say, their father had to say. He was a role model for them from before nubuwa and prophethood. He was already the person whom they looked up to. They loved him so much. He was upright. He had a very, very high standing even in Quraysh. He was known as As-Sadiq Al-Ameen, the truthful, the trustworthy from the beginning. Subhanallah, from many, many years before that. Then we have Abu Bakr As-Siddiq radiallahu an. For your information, he suffered a lot after accepting Islam. At this stage, Islam was only spread by word of mouth to particular people who were chosen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to get up and warn those who were the closest to him in what was known as the secret call or the call which was preliminary, the first call. And that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu being one of the best friends, if not the best friend of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was spoken to and immediately he surrendered. He said, if you are saying this, I immediately declare that you are definitely the worshipper or the, the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his worshipper. So that was Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. So much so that he was persecuted in Mecca thereafter. You see, news started flying and rumors started spreading. What was this news and rumor? People began to say, this man is, has come with something new and news started flying but there was no confirmed news in the sense that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had not declared anything openly but people began to whisper and you and I know that when you tell someone don't tell anyone it's quicker for that type of news to spread than when you come out openly with it may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness I think we are far worse than the people of that time when it comes to spreading rumor because we supposed to be believers Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we declare him as a Nabi, but still we love rumor and we love gossip and we love tales and mostly it doesn't even affect us. It's not connected to us and it perhaps is lies in most cases, but that makes the juicy iftar that we actually spoil our fast with. May Allah protect us.
Allahu Akbar. Imagine having a dry piece of bread for iftar. I think our people know what marination is all about and they know what all the spices and everything is all about in order to give it the spike, to make it more tasty. Let that not happen in our speech and language when it comes to speaking about people. May we be upright. May we be truthful. May we learn to cover the faults of others rather than what the West is teaching us today. Go out and expose everybody. That's the West. That's the Western teaching. In Islam, we are taught cover people and remember make dua for them you want to address a problem go to them and address it directly you don't have to go and spread you spread other people spread they add spices about you and you add about them what happens society becomes a bunch of people who are just talking about one another so at that particular time there was whisperings whisperings amongst people that there is something going on here something going on here Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu accepted the message he did not deny that he accepted the message. If someone asked him, he would not deny that I have accepted a message and there is a message. So the news began to spread. We have others who accepted. We made mention of Ummu Ayman radiallahu anha. The one who looked after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from a very, very early age. In fact, from birth, she was already there. She was the slave of Amina binti Wahab, the mother of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Later on, he inherited her from his mother sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he freed her when he married Khadija binti Khuwaylid radiallahu anha. And thereafter we see that she was one of those who accepted Islam primarily right at the beginning. We mentioned yesterday that when a man has his own family members bear witness that he is upright, then indeed he is upright. Because your family members see you 24-7. Let's ask ourselves, are we like that or are we the opposite? Sometimes with us, everybody thinks we're really nice and everybody thinks that we are really good people and our own wives and children are the ones who say, this man, you don't know his true colors. You really don't know. He troubles us, he harasses us, he swears. When he comes home, he's a different man. The minute he answers the phone, the tone is such that had he spoken with that tone in the house, perhaps the love would have increased. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and grant us every form of lesson. This is why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's family accepted first because he was the role model for them right from the very beginning. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us conscious of the way we treat our own families and family members. So Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was one of those who accepted Islam. And when his uncle Al-Hakam ibn Abil As found out that this Uthman ibn Affan ibn Abil As has accepted Islam, what did his uncle do? He went to him and said, hey, I am disassociating myself from you completely. You will have no link with me. You cannot come to me and I don't want you to come to us. You have nothing to do with us unless you disbelieve in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Uthman ibn Affan was 34 years old at the time. He looked at his uncle and he said, Oh uncle, do what you want. You can cut me. You can really disassociate from me. I am not going to abandon what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has come with, nor am I going to disbelieve. So after some time, when his uncle realized that this young man is not going to give up anything and he was already quite old anyway, then they softened up. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us such understanding that we have so many freedoms and we have nobody blocking us and stopping us. Why do we still not find ourselves obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's instructions? Another example was Az Zubair ibn al Awam radiallahu an. He was only 12 years old and the, his uncle had tied him up and they used to smoke him with the smoke of the fire and told him as a young boy that we want you to leave. We want you to disbelieve in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The young boy, he understood from the message that here the people are worshipping their sticks and stones and idols. And here Muhammad ibn Abdullah is calling us to worship our maker. He is warning us, he is telling us to behave well, not to drink, not to commit adultery and so on. At that time alcohol was not prohibited yet, but there were other rules that were in place. And subhanallah, they were pure and good. Young boy understood this. Not He was not the only one. Many of these young boys, they understood in their teens, they understood this. And they faced persecution from their family members. They still did not give it up. Subhanallah. What were they gaining with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in terms of material wealth or status? Nothing. 
They were gaining nothing in terms of material wealth. They were only pure believers. They believed in something purely. And above the persecution, they still remained steadfast. Subhanallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept him. Another one who was 17 years old, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu. For your information, these that I have mentioned so far, they are from the high families of Quraysh. They are children of the lofty. They are children of people who were well to do and they had good standings and positions in Quraysh. And this is why their parents wanted them back. Their family members wanted them back because to them it was an insult for these children of ours to actually turn. Wallahi, I need to stop there for a moment. Some of us, when we move around with our own daughters who want to cover from head to toe, we feel so bad to say, how can I walk in the mall whilst you covered from top to bottom? Come on, man, you're still so young. How, why are you covering? Some of us discourage our own daughters when they want to turn to their deen. So we are also guilty sometimes. Some of us, when our children would like to grow facial hair, following the example of all the messengers, including Jesus, may peace be upon him, then we tend to ban them. Ban them completely. Say, listen, you know what? If you are not going to use this Gillette with a, shave, with a shaving cream, then you cannot live in this home. We don't want you to look so scruffy. A'udhu Billah. We call the Sunnah scruffy and yet we claim to be believers. So what is the difference between us and the Kuffar of Quraysh? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. They were embarrassed when their children accepted Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's message. Wallahi, sometimes we become embarrassed at the same thing. Why should that be? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who are proud of the achievements of our children in a way that they can correct us and we nod our head when they arrive to say, My son, Allah has given you that knowledge. You came to me today. You told it to me. Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me a child like this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. Wallahi, what I have said is a serious matter. If we are weak, it's one thing. But why should we impose that weakness on our own children? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and grant us steadfastness. So this young boy, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu, when his mother found out that this son of mine has accepted the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she went up to him. What is it, O Sa'ad? He declared, yes, it's a fact, it's true. They did not deny it. So she says, I will stand in the sun, in the heat, and I will not eat, and I will not drink, and I am not going to move from here until you reject Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you come back to our idols, and you come back to the religion of your forefathers, and you worship these sticks and stones once again. What happened to him? He was steadfast. He says, oh my mother, that's up to you. I am not going to give up anything. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thereafter was asked, by Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu that look, it's the second day running, my mother is still out there. It's the third day running, my mother is still out there. Obviously there's a link. So verses were revealed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down verses. Allah has instructed you to be very kind to your parents, even if they are non-Muslim. Allah has instructed you to be very kind to your parents. Remember, Allah has chosen your parents and my parents for me and you. We did not apply for our parents. It's Allah's test upon us to, for having given us or by having given us parents whom we have because Allah knows that was the means of him bringing us into creation. And this is why he says you need to honor that link and you need to respect it. But there is one exception. Whenever they instruct you to engage in polytheism or to misbehave spiritually or to disobey the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's the only time you don't obey their instruction. Anything to do with the sin, you don't obey them. But anything else, no matter who your parent is and what they've done and whatever has happened, and they can be non-Muslim, you need to obey their instructions and fulfill their rights. And you need to make sure you have been kind to them and you have looked after them as best as you can on condition that they have not instructed you to do something sinful. 
And this is why Allah says at the end of those verses that you will then return to Allah, all of you, both parties. Then he will inform you of your deeds and what you used to do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and may he forgive us. So when those verses were revealed, they gave comfort to Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anh. And after some time, you find the effects of these people's attitude calm down. And they also calmed down. They softened up a little bit because they knew no turning back. We don't know of a single person of the early Muslims who turned back from their faith. Not even one. Because why would they have entered in the first place? To enter the faith, you needed to have lots of courage. You needed to go against your families and your tribe and those who were worshipping idols and so on. It was easier for Christians to turn to Islam because the faith is quite similar. But it was very difficult for the people of Quraysh because their faith was worlds apart. They were worshipping stones. They never believed in the life after death. They just thought, مَا هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا نَمُوتُ وَنَحْيَا It is only this life. We are dead, we are alive. That's it. So enjoy life. Like the attitude of people today. You know what's the statement today? They say, life comes once, so enjoy it. Go out and catch as much as you can. Life just comes once, you're going to miss out. We as Muslims have a different attitude. This is your test. The ultimate life is yet to come. So this is why don't fool around here. Otherwise you lose what is to come. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our sins, our shortcomings, and may he grant us a new chapter. Remember, no matter what we've done, Allah is ghafoorur rahim. It is us who need to turn. Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. We need to turn to him before it is too late. Another example. The example of Talha ibn Ubaidillah. Radiyallahu anh, he was 13 years old and he had heard from some of the rabbis, from some of the religious people of the people of the book, some of the qualities of a messenger who was going to come. So what had happened? When Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu anh, who spoke to this young boy in his early teens, he immediately surrendered because he said, no, I've heard about this. I know it's happening. It's coming. And if it's him, then I am with. Subhanallah. Imagine early teens. Look at our youngsters, mashallah. These were young people who changed their lives. They knew what was right from wrong. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as old as we are, grant us the ability to distinguish between right and wrong and then to follow that which is right, even if it is against our own whims and fancies and lusts and desires. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us steadfastness. Another example was that of Ammar ibn Yasir. Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anhu and his family. They are well known in the history of Islam. It was known as Al Yasir, the family of Yasir. Yasir was the father and Ammar was the son. The mother was known as Sumayyah, the brother as well. Subhanallah, what happened? They accepted Islam. And they were slaves. They were slaves. And what had happened? Their master began to punish them and penalize them. How can you declare the faith of this man and stop worshipping the idols and so on? Who do you think you are? You are still a slave. And they started being punished. And how were they punished? Drawn in the hot desert. And what happened was the armor which was made of metal was made to become so hot and then they were made to wear it. And on top of that, they were left out in the heat. They were tortured with fire. They were tortured with whips. And all they were told was just say that I disbelieve in Muhammad. That's it. There's nothing else that you need to come up with. Just say I disbelieve in the one God and I want to return to all these idols that you people are worshipping. They refused. So what happened? The first martyr, the first person to be killed by the kuffar of Quraysh, by the, by the disbelievers of Quraysh, was Sumayyah radiallahu anha, Ummu Yasir. And it is so bad what they did to her. They ripped her apart. They literally tore her into pieces. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant her paradise. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to pass these people. Imagine slaves. Today we look at people who are lower than us in terms of finance and we think these people are low down and you know, perhaps they don't have a standing. Wallahi, get one thing right in your mind and mine. That is, Allah does not look at your financial standing, nor does he look at your color or your body. He looks at your heart and what is in it. Subhanallah. So there are people who are saints, who are so pious, who are the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they live in huts in some of the most remote areas of Africa and elsewhere. 
And yet we may not even know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them goodness and us as well. So these people were martyred. This lady, this Sumayya radiallahu anha was martyred when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed them. He could not utter much. They could not help much. But he said, Sabran ala yasir fa inna mawidakumul jannah. Bear patience, O family of Yasir. Our appointed time and place is paradise. Allahu Akbar. Imagine, our appointed time and place is paradise. Which means just bear it. Bear it. They bore it. The one was martyred. Subhanallah. What happened to Ammar himself? He couldn't bear it. There came a stage when they punished him and penalized him and he was a young boy. Until... He uttered the word. He said, okay, I disbelieve in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He uttered the word. So the Muslims were shocked. Some of them had the statement in them saying, this man has disbelieved. This is the first of ours who has disbelieved. He's given in to pressure. He has turned away. And do you know what? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, his heart is full of conviction. He has just uttered a statement by his mouth in order to save himself. Subhanallah. Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam came down with verses where he clarified, Allah had clarified the condition of Ammar ibn Yasir radiyallahu anhu. Man kafara billahi min ba'di imanihi illa man ukriha wa qalbuhu mutma'innu bil iman. وَلَكِنْ مَنْ شَرَحَ بِالْكُفْرِ صَدْرًا فَعَلَيْهِمْ غَضَبٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ Allah is clarifying the difference between those who have disbelieved, believing in that disbelief, and those who have uttered a word by their mouths in order to protect themselves, yet their hearts are full of belief. Allah says, when it gets to a certain point, then you need to know if you've uttered a word of disbelief in order to be protected because you could not handle what came in your direction. That does not automatically make you a disbeliever. So Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anhu, his condition was made clear. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. Imagine the persecution they went through. Imagine what had happened to them. Subhanallah. Another example was that of Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu, the Abyssinian slave who had come to Makkah al-Mukarramah enslaved. And his master's name was Umayyah ibn Khalaf, one of the biggest enemies of Islam, one of the leaders of Quraysh. When he found out that this little slave of mine has accepted the message of Muhammad, imagine, now this was a person who was a little bit lower down in the social standing, but one of the highest in the spiritual standing. Subhanallah. You know, some people say that the early believers were all weak and downtrodden. No, that's not true. There were a few people who might have been weak, but the bulk of them were wealthy, well-to-do people from wealthy families at least, even if themselves they may not have been as wealthy or the wealthiest, but they were from the best of families. And this is what we need to understand. Not all of them were weak. But there were some who were slaves, a few, a handful of them, like Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu an. What happened to him? The same thing. They took him out in the desert. The boulders were made hot and he was dragged in these rocks and stones and sand of the desert. And big boulders were put up onto his chest and he was whipped and lashed one after the other. He bled and he was being told, disbelieve in Muhammad. And he was one of those who was solid, one of the most powerful when it comes to declaring his conviction that there is only one God, only one. The message was a message of worshipping one Allah. So he kept on repeating, Ahadun Ahad. Ahadun Ahad. There is only one, one God, one God. Your idols mean nothing. It's only one God, one Allah, one, one. He kept on repeating, one, one. And he was lashed, and he was whipped, and he was beaten. And it continued until one day Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, who was a good businessman, he spent all his wealth buying back the slaves from people who were punishing those slaves who had accepted Islam. Subhanallah. So he made money, he spent it. To do what? Buying back a slave from a person. For what reason? Just to free them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that they are not punished anymore. How many of us can even spend our money when we say our money, remember one thing, my beloved brothers and sisters, the zakah that we give out, 
does not belong to us. That is Allah's wealth. We have just placed it where it belongs by giving it out. Those compulsory charities, as we call them as Muslims, zakah, we have to give them whether we like it or not. Doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the Almighty. All we have done, we've taken it as an amana, as a trust, and we've put it where it belongs. But what is counted is the fact that we were upright and we were truthful. Now if you really want to engage in monetary charities, give something that is from your own wealth that you don't owe, but give out sadaqat and lillahat as we call them, something for the sake of Allah, from your own heart. Not that it was compulsory so you gave it, give out more than that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. This Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he did not have to do this. He was one of those most generous people. He loved helping people in need. And when it came to Islam, imagine what type of need there was. So Bilal ibn Rabah one day was being punished by Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was passing. And he says, O oh, Umayyah, aren't you ashamed of what you are doing to this slave? A young boy, helpless, what are you doing to him? So Umayyah says, you are the one who spoiled him. Meaning, you are also a believer just like him. You spoiled him. He says, what will you do to save him? So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says, you sell him to me. He says, I will sell him. Here's the price. Take him, free the man. The man was freed. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Look at Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had guaranteed him a place in paradise already. Before he died, well before he died, it was already told a group of people, a certain number of people were already told that you are from amongst those in paradise. From amongst them was the same African slave, Bilal ibn Rabah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him when he came back from Mi'raj, when he came back from the ascension, he says, Oh Bilal, I have heard your footsteps in paradise. Subhanallah. Inshallah, we'll get to that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and strengthen us. So that was the example of Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu. You have another example of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. We hear his name so many times with so many ahadith. And we hear his name when it comes even to the tafsir of the Quran. And we hear that he was an expert in recitation, in tafsir, in hadith. He was an expert in deen at large, obviously. Subhanallah, radiallahu anhu. May Allah be pleased with him. What was he doing? He was a young man who was a shepherd. He used to herd the flock of the leaders of Quraysh. And when he saw some clear signs, in that which Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was calling towards, and when he heard the message of goodness, and he heard that the message is all about fulfilling your duty, being a good person, being upright, being noble, not lying, not cheating, not stealing, not deceiving, not committing adultery, not swearing, and so on. He immediately accepted it, and he became from amongst the Muslimin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen them all and grant us also goodness. And another very interesting story. A man known very commonly as Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu from a place known as Ghifar. Ghifar between Mecca and Asham, going up to the Syrian region as we had mentioned, Asham. There is a place not very far from Mecca known as Ghifar. That's where they used to pass from with their caravans. So he heard that there is a messenger in Mecca and this is what he is uttering. So he tells his brother Unais, he says, oh my brother, you know what? We've heard this. Pack a little bit of provision for yourself. Go to Mecca and listen to what this man has to say and bring back some news. So the brother went to Mecca quietly and he listened to what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to say. And thereafter he went back to Ghifar and he spoke to Abu Dhar. And Abu Dhar, his name was Jundub ibn Junada radiallahu anhu. That was his proper name, Jundub ibn Junada. They used to call him Abu Dhar. As we mentioned yesterday, Abdullah ibn Uthman is the name of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. But it's just that sometimes these names became more common, known as a kunya, known as person father of or mother of so and so, it becomes more common. So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari heard his brother and said, no, 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 that's not enough. What you are telling me, I need more than this. Let me pack my own little provisions and go. So obviously he was told by his brother of the condition in Mecca that you see the Quraysh there, they are really persecuting those who have believed. So just mind your step. 
So Abu Dharr al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu went to Mecca. He got to the Kaaba and he didn't want to ask anyone who is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he said just now I asked the wrong person and I'm in trouble. So he decided to wait for a while according to one of the narrations and looking around and seeing and nightfall came and he was still watching and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu saw this man and recognized that this man is not from here. So he says, come, I give you a bedding, you can sleep. So they, he gave him a bedding and he spent the night there. And the following day, he packed his provisions again and he went back to that area around the Kaaba. And he spent a while. Now, at that time, the pagan Arabs, they had lots of, uh, meaning some of the good qualities that they have had was hospitality, entertaining the guests. They would not ask people for three days. They wouldn't ask that, why have you come here? With us, we have a habit. When you came, and what's the next question? When you're going. You see, everybody's laughing here. When you came and when you're going. MashaAllah, I hope that is asked with a good heart because you want to help a person, you know, go nicely. Alhamdulillah. But what happens is, uh, with them, they didn't used to ask a question. Why you came? No. When are you going? No. Three days later, it was their right to ask, look, why have you come here? Because they believe that. And Islam, for your information, reiterated that goodness and said, even as Muslims, for three days, your guest has a right. Thereafter, Alhamdulillah, you can ask them questions and you can even begin to charge them for your hospitality. You know, up to very recently, those who've been for Hajj in the 60s and so on, they will tell you that in Saudi Arabia, those who used to go for Hajj in the 1960s and earlier, nobody asked them for three days to pay anything. The muallim that was there, you could stay with him. And three days later, you had to decide whether you wanted to be there or not. Perhaps they started charging because of some wise cracks like us. We go here three days. When we see we've overstayed here, we go to another man's place for three days. When we see we've overstayed there, we go to another man's for three days until the hajj is over. So I think to cover that, we are charged even before we arrive. Have you noticed that now? MashaAllah. May Allah protect us and may he make it easy for us. Allahu Akbar. You miss your flight, you dead meat. Why? You didn't arrive, but your money is gone. Allahu Akbar. Not only for the flight that you're going to have to pay now for the new one, but even for the day that you didn't stay. They tell you money is gone, and on top of that, your accommodation was given to someone else. Have you heard this? I'm sure those who've been, it sounds all too common to them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us hospitality. May He make us from those who stand upright, really. And may He make us from those who realize and learn a lesson even if it means learning a lesson from the ignorant where they are correct, if they are correct. Subhanallah. So, Ali ibn Abi Talib, the third day, he asks Abu Dhar, can I ask you why you are here? So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, radiallahu anhu, he says, if you promise me that you're not going to harm me, and if you promise me that I am safe and secure by telling you why I'm here, then I can let you know. So he says, I promise. He says, I have heard there is a messenger who calls towards goodness. He calls towards worshipping one Allah. He calls towards abandoning the idols. He calls towards respect of parents. He calls towards being upright and fulfilling the rights. He calls towards the banning of burying girls and women alive. He calls towards the banning of the maltreatment of women and so on. So I have come to see him and to pledge allegiance with him. So Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu told him, he is indeed a messenger and yes, he is in our midst. How fortunate was this man? He arrived at the right man's place. So he said, tomorrow morning, you follow me. We don't want people to see you with me, but you follow me. If there is any harm, I'll pretend like I'm pouring some water. If I pretend like I'm pouring some water, you know that now you don't follow me, you can head in your own direction. But if there is no harm, you follow me and I'll take you all the way to this place and you'll meet him. So subhanallah, the following day, that's exactly what happened. The two of them followed each other and mashallah, they arrived in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu heard as he entered words of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he broke down and immediately declared his shahada. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. And he told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he had come from and what had happened. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a dua for him and told him, go back to your people and wait there until you hear of me, you know, in a, in a way that will be much more open than this. And in a short period of time, the 
open call had taken place and news spread across the entire peninsula subhanallah there is a history of what happened to ghifar allahu akbar the dua of muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam abu dhar al ghifari members of his family accepted islam members of his clan accepted islam they went back to muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam later on perhaps inshallah we will get there at that stage so this was the plight of the people the condition of the people who came even during this period of silence where they came from afar to look for the truth and they found it and they adopted it and accepted it we have also the others whom we need to make mention of in fact abu dhar al ghifari we are not yet completed with his story there's a point that is made mention of where when he was so excited that he had accepted Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's call, he went out by the Kaaba and made the announcement, I bear witness that there is only one, there is only Allah worthy of worship, no one else. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The people of Quraysh began to beat him up. There. They started beating him up so much that they made him bleed. According to one narration, Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib got up and told the people of Quraysh, Hey, hang on. This man is from Ghifar. Do you know where Ghifar is? Ghifar comes on the way to Sham. We pass there with our caravans and our wealth. We are going to be really in big trouble if we have made this man suffer here. You'd better stop. And that's when they stopped. Subhanallah. Imagine. Their wealth was more important than anything else. They knew we are now going to pass on our own with this caravan going past Ghifar. There's going to be an issue. So that is why they stopped. Then we have the others just to mention some of the names. We have Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu, Abu Ubaidah, Amr ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu, Uthman ibn Mad'oon, Saeed ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu, his wife Fatima bint al-Khattab. She accepted Islam very early the sister of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, she accepted Islam very early. Another one who accepted Islam was Khabbab ibn al-Arat. We will come to his story as well, inshallah. And Khalid ibn Sa'id ibn al-As. And another one who accepted Islam from the Makhzum tribe was a man known as Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam. He was also in his teens and he accepted Islam from a very lofty family. A lot of these people Quraysh was scared of harming them because of the family, because of the clan. Sometimes people want to beat you up, but they see you've got a brother. So they look, they say, hey, if you didn't have that guy as your brother, we'd have beaten him up, subhanallah. Or they see you've got a bit of power, or you do business with them, so they keep quiet because of the business. This is the policy of the people of Quraysh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us forgiveness and steadfastness. So Al-Arqam ibn Abil Arqam, his house was then used as a secret meeting point to learn and study revelation and the deen that was being revealed. The verses at the time that were being revealed were connected to the oneness of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Belief in the life after death, heaven and hell and the various teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam connected to belief. Because that was what was the most important thing at that particular time. The belief had to be corrected. It was filthy at the time and it would only be cleansed through Tawheed. And this is why one of the most important aspects was the fact that these idols and everything besides Allah cannot harm or benefit. It is only Allah who is in absolute control of everything. So you worship Allah alone. So they used to gather in the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abil Arqam radiallahu anhu and they used to learn the verses that were being revealed one by one. Remember the ver verses were not all revealed at once but they were revealed bit by bit as something happened the verses were revealed inshallah. We will get to see a little bit more of that later on in the month. Then we have subhanallah something very important. What happened is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam once when he was in a certain part of Mecca. And Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam taught him wudu. Wudu is the ablution, how we wash ourselves before we come in for prayer and salah. And how that happened is a little rock was made to gush water from and that water was used for Jibreel alayhi salam who had come in the form of a human being to make wudu whilst Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was watching and then he repeated the wudu and then Jibreel alayhi salam taught him salah 
And Ibn Hisham makes mention of this in his seerah that Jibreel alayhi salam taught Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam salah at the very early stages, although it was not compulsory as it is today. When salah was first revealed, it was only two rak'ah at a time. Mathna, mathna, two rak'ah, two rak'ah. And it was a means of ibadah, an act of worship. Those who wanted to worship, this is the way they would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put their heads on the ground for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Slightly different from what came later on, we know that salah became compulsory at mi'raj. But it was taught before that. Because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to read salah at night. And the sahaba radiallahu anhum prior to mi'raj, they used to offer voluntary prayers at night. This is mentioned in the surahs in the Quran. And this is how it had started. So if someone asks you, when was salah made compulsory? You say, upon mi'raj. And when was salah taught to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In the early stages, during the silent call to the, uh, to the family members and friends in Makkah al-Mukarramah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us steadfast with salah. We look at salah today as a burden. Yet, it was given as a gift by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us. The day we consider salah a gift, we will be able to achieve its true sweetness and we will be able to taste the benefit of that salah. When we fulfill salah because we want to fulfill it, not because we have to fulfill it. As I said earlier before the Isha salah, there is a difference between fulfilling a prayer because you have to do it and doing it because you want to do it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who fulfill it because we want to fulfill it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us. So that was a little bit about the history of how salah was taught to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then we have another very, very interesting incident that occurred at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At that stage, when they wanted to pray, they used to go out, they used to hide, they used to go into some of the valleys, they used to go to the outlying areas of Mecca, and they used to pray. And they had not yet got to 40 people, 30-something people. That is the number of people who had accepted, slowly but surely. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Warn your family, your tribesmen, the kindred, those around you, warn them. Now that meant that now we can no longer be silent. We now got to warn the people. So what did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? I'm going to make mention of the story which is very moving and very touching. And it should serve as a lesson to all of us. He gathered the people of the tribes that were considered his own ashira, his own people. He called them tribe by tribe. From the Mount of Safa, where he had climbed up, it was quite a high mount. He climbed up and he began to call the names of these little tribes. And he called the names of certain people as well. So everyone was shocked because there was rumor around and there was persecution, obviously, individually. But on a wholesale level, no one dared had the guts to do what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had just done. And this is why they were shocked. This man has just called out. What is it? Is he wanting to give up everything? Well, if that happens, then it will be good for us. But they were in for something else. As they went, some of the leaders couldn't make it, so they sent representatives. One of the people who came there, Abu Lahab, who was one of the uncles of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was actually an uncle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he arrived there and they all looking and listening and waiting. What is this man about to say? So he makes an announcement and he's standing at the top and they're all listening to him. He says, if I were to tell you that at the back of this mountain, there is an army of horsemen coming to attack you, to destroy you. Would you believe what I have just said? And all of them said, yes, indeed. We have never heard you lie. Imagine. We have never heard you lie. Subhanallah. We would believe you immediately. He says, فَإِنِّي نَذِيرٌ لَكُمْ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ عَذَابٍ شَدِيدٍ So I am warning you of a severe punishment that is about to come. Subhanallah. I am warning you of a punishment that is about to come. 
and then he began to tell them to do good deeds because he will not be able to save them from that fire or from that punishment just because he is a tribesman or he is a family man or he is a relative he won't be able to save them so he came out saying the names of the clans he says save yourselves from the fire saying the names of certain people save yourself from the fire for I will not be able to help you and he delivered the message openly so that was the reason why he had gathered them around that Mount Safa and how he started the message just to prove to them that you consider me truthful if I were to lie, I would not have lied about this particular thing. And you know that I am not a liar. But still, Abu Lahab, with his big mouth and arrogance because of his standing in Quraysh, and he was the son of a top leader of Quraysh, and this was his nephew, but he had no respect for his nephew because this would mean he's acknowledging a man above him. You see, this was the problem with the people. They did not want to accept because they would be acknowledging someone above them. They thought we're going to lose our power. We're going to lose this throne that we're sitting on. The wealth that we're sitting on, this man is going to take over everything. And if we acknowledge and we accept, what will happen to us? So they refused. Abu Lahab says, Tabbalaka, ya Muhammad. Destruction be upon you, O Muhammad. Ali hadha jama'atana. Is this why you gathered us here? And the people were looking at him because he had the guts. That was a swear word basically. Meaning insulting Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tabban lak. The others were quiet. So what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam with one of the most powerful, most eloquent surahs that had been revealed up to that time. And so easy to memorize that even the children of Quraysh memorized these verses and on the streets everyone was uttering them Muslim and non-Muslim Subhanallah what were the verses this man Abu Lahab he said Tabbalaka Ya Muhammad destruction be upon you O Muhammad so Allah says Tabbat yada Abi Lahab wa tabba ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab سيصلى نارا ذات لهب وامرأته حمالة الحطب في جيدها حبل من مسد الله says destruction be to both your hands O Abu Lahab a total destruction his wealth will not help him in any way nothing his wealth did not assist him or help him neither in his life nor in his death because that is the Quranic injunction. And nothing that he earned will help him, Abu Lahab. And he will indeed go into hellfire. Abu Lahab and his wife who is the carrier of the fuel. Al-Hatab means the firewood. Why was she termed carrier of the firewood? The one who kindled the fire in which they would both burn. Because she had a very bad habit. Lesson for us to learn. She used to go around the women of Quraysh. Gossiping. Talking about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Adding spices and lying. Lying to them about what he used to say. And she had a habit of going around. Telling this one, that one. Today, Vodacom has made it easy for us. Allah protect us. They tell you night shift from 12 to 5. One wonders who calls at the time. But dial, numbers engaged. What's happening? We don't want to be Hammalat al Hatab. Wallahi. We don't want to be carriers of that fuel. Talk about this one, talk about that one. No. If you don't need it, let that night shift pass. The month expire. They tell you you no longer deserve that and you haven't even used it once, but you saved yourself from the fire of Jahannam. Why do we need to call just because it's free? These free minutes and this free method of communication, use it for the benefit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning for the benefit of us when it comes to our link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't use it for our destruction. So Ummu Jamil, that was her name. Allah describes her, Allah says, you know, fi jidiha. A jid is this neck, tender, soft, beautiful neck known as jid. And then Allah says, on that neck, there is hablum min masad. There is 
more or less a necklace of thorns, so to speak. Subhanallah. Imagine a necklace of a rope full of thorns on that neck by which she shall be pulled. Allahu Akbar. Allah protect us. Look at the description. So as lofty as she seems she is and as well dressed as she may be and as one of the wives of one of the leaders of Quraysh as she may think she is. Allah says, watch out. You will be dragged into the fire and it is going to happen. Now, one of the secrets of the Quran is when the Quran has cursed someone by name, there is no hope of them accepting Islam ever. It's over. So she was so angry. She actually went a few days later or the next day and she picked up a stone and wanted to throw it upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was sitting near the Kaaba with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. But Allah made her blind. So she looks at Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is right next to him. And she says, Abu Bakr, where is that friend of yours? If I see him, I will throw this rock on him and so on. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, Ya Abu Bakr, Allah has made her blind from seeing me so she can't see me. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Inshallah, we will continue tomorrow if Allah gives us the life and the memory inshallah to continue from where we left off until then we say wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina muhammad subhanallah wa bihamdih subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu